it is important that you do the best job you can right where you're sitting right now. Because the, the people that you're around every day are the people that can speak to your ability to yeah. do whatever the next job is better than anyone else. Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. Today, we are joined by the assistant coach of the Indiana Pacers, Ronald Norred. Coach Norred played college basketball at Butler University from 2008 to 2012. After graduating, he briefly coached at the high school and college level before Brad Stevens, his former college coach, offered him a coaching position with the Boston Celtics. He served as a head coach for the Maine Red Claws of the NBA G League, and then the Brooklyn Nets hired him to be the first head coach of the Long Island Nets. Coach Norred was the first ever PGC Hall of Fame inductee in 2017. Before we hear from Coach, take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media at Jamoti Podcast. What's going on? What's up, Coach? How are we doing? Man, I'm living the dream. How are you? I'm doing the same. Yeah. Doing the same. A little oh. off-season time, so enjoying it. Yeah. So uh, is this a time where you maybe just watch a little bit more basketball? I mean, I know that's kind of what you do all year long, but – or do you take a break? Uh, take a break. Yeah. So the and NBA, I, the, NBA know, playoffs, like, kind of just – that. Yeah, they're they're on, and I, you know – I'm paying attention and stuff, but uh, I'm paying a little attention. But, you know, this is time with family and things yeah. like that. So it's not – I'm not, like, dialed 100% in all the time. It's a little easier, obviously, when the kids go to bed. But how the season end up for you? Man, it was a good one. Very, very satisfying. I had yeah. a group that overachieved and were, they were a joy to coach. Uh, I had some adversity come their way, but I thought they handled it really well. So – those seasons are always fun. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny, like your, your season with, with what you do, it's a little bit more public. And so, you know, I'll ask you the same question. How do you feel like the, the season went? Uh, I think it ultimately, in, like, we ended on a 10-game losing streak, um, which was tough. But it felt like a – it felt really positive um, in a lot of ways uh, for a lot of different reasons. But – you know, we had pretty high expectations coming into the season, make playoffs. You know, I think even Vegas had us as like sixth or seventh, you know, best record in the East. And uh, and we started off poorly and then we hit injuries and then we had COVID and it just kind of, you know, spiraled into something that, you know, <laughs> you don't really want. Um, and, then, and then the trade deadline came and then our team changed completely. Um, but we gained some really good players, you know, like a corner piece and and um, Tyrese Halliburton and, um, you know, Buddy Hill's a good piece. And so, you know, <laughs> yeah. we have to see some young guys um, play a little bit more. So there were definitely a lot of positives moving into next season. But, you know, it wasn't winning. I think we won 25 games as you know, that's great for a college team, but for a, uh, <laughs> an well, you got 82, 82 of them. Yeah. <laughs> Not great. So, but I think we feel good going into next year. For me, uh, you know, you, you're, so you're with the Pacers still, correct? Yeah. The, the, yeah so correct. you being an, an NBA assistant coach, like it's incredible, like the honor to get to talk to somebody in your position. But for me, this is even more special because for though, I mean, if we have any PGC, either grads or former coaches, directors uh, like that watch this, they will instantly know who you are because you're, you're PGC. You're a PGC legend. How does that sound? <laughs> um, humbling and a little, little crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I did, I did five summers for them uh, uh, directing with them. They're just super impactful. Love all those guys. And I did point guard college, the last one before mm -hmm. grad school. And so it was every, I mean, every, so five s sessions a summer, every summer talking about you and, and the, the player that you were at Butler, but then the, more importantly, like the impact you had there and then your journey to the NBA with Brad yeah. Stevens. So like, 
uh, it's just it's kind of a blast for me to get to do this with you just so you know <laughs> it's funny thinking about that because literally you know i went to pgc as a 15 and 16 year old and it was you know i just went there to become a better leader and you know my high school coach recommended it to me and i was i like i wanted to be better you know and you know i really believed in everything that he had for me so i looked at this pamphlet you know which kids i bet don't even know what that is anymore like <laughs> I looked at it and I'm like, yeah, I'll go there. You know, there was one here in Anderson, Indiana. Uh, my family lived here in Indianapolis. So I, I came up here to Indianapolis, stayed with my family, then went up to Anderson. And it was it was a great experience for me, but it never, to, for it to turn into something like, you know, people talking about me frequently, you know, the Hall of Fame thing that happened. The Hall of ago, Fame. Like all that stuff is like. I didn't go there for any of that. You know? like, I, I went there. Whatever, man. Listen, yeah. when you were 15, you went to that camp knowing full well that you would be a part of every session from, from then on and that you would be inducted in, with Debbie Black. Yeah, seriously. Because I was there at that Cancun uh, yeah. deal. Like, uh, you knew sure. all along, man. I did. I did. My <laughs> high school coach said, you're going to be a legend. Go to this. <laughs> how, how does culture drive performance? I think uh, I think culture is the biggest backbone of performance. My um, my pastor, when I was in well, my year after college, uh, I was here in Indianapolis. I actually go to this church again now that I'm I'm back with the Pacers. Um, he said, if your strategy is the race car, then culture is the racetrack. And without a strong foundation that saw a racetrack, the strategy and whatever you're trying to do as that race car, it, it can't move, right? And um, if there's dents in it, if there's potholes, like we have a ton in Indiana, um, that racetrack, that race car is going to get torn up. And so I think that without a strong culture, um, I think having a consistent, strong performance is, is diff uh, ability to perform is difficult. and. I think, you know, one thing that we all have, we all have a culture. Everyone has a culture. Yeah. To me, culture is about intentionality. And, um, you know, we all talk about like, what is culture? What is this? And I had a guy that I worked with um, when I was a head coach um, for the Long Island Nets, Brooklyn's G League team, that made it really simple for me. And I've used it ever since. It's culture is just behavior. And so the intentionality of what are the behaviors of our program um, that we're going to be intentional about living out is what culture is. And I think the best cultures are the ones that are intentional to say, we just have a culture and to not consistently live it out, I think uh, creates a um, instability in what you're doing and who you're saying you're gonna be. Um, and so I'm a big believer in culture. Um, I've coached at all the levels, all the way up to the NBA, the culture of your team and the, and the intentionality behind that culture, I've seen it done well. I've seen it not done so well. Um, all the way down to when I was coaching eighth grade girls, um, when I was coaching college, same thing. Um, I think culture is number one thing. And I think it is the number one thing that drives our performance. I love that idea of the racetrack. And I mean, I, I literally am just coming off of our second period athletics where I had, you know, 16 to 18 young men. We we're working on skill, but they were walking quite a bit in between drills. And, and it's that decision that we have as coaches in that moment. It's the spring. We're out of season. How much do I fight for that? And how much do I just allow them just to be or do what they want at that point? Talk about, because in my brain, I, I, I was never near. the. I played in Iceland. That was the closest to pro basketball. <laughs> the only place in the world that wanted me to play there. <laughs> you know, but... In my mind, I think that every NBA team has a fantastic culture. They're pros. They're professionals. They have the best minds in the world. But how hard do you have to fight for your culture, even at that level? I would say not every NBA team, just to kind of just to kind of address that, has a great culture. Um, and you know, because again, culture is behavior, and behavior is what people, right? And so yeah. there's a lot of things that get in the way of, of behavior, and you know, just our human nature. Um, gets in the way of that but at this level and I think at any level but at this level um you the biggest thing I think with culture at this level is involving players and I think you know 
I, I, I've said before, like what we do at the NBA level because of the the structure of it, the the, the amount of power that the players have. Um, as a coach, you have to be really humble and, and understand where you sit in that. But I think that applies at every single level. That's how it should be at every level. That's how it should be if I'm a grade school coach, I'm a middle school coach, high school, you know, whatever the case may be. It's about the players, right? And so we have to, you know, in middle school, you don't necessarily have to involve your players to build a great culture. But at this level, you do. Yeah, uh, You should. You should yeah. at the middle school yeah. level, right, at any level. But uh, at this level, you have to. If you're going to come in, go ahead, go ahead. No, involving them and letting them run the show are very different things because you don't want middle school or high school kids, maybe even college kids necessarily running the show. But I love your idea of involving them. Keep going. Yeah, we and we don't want our players to run the show either. I mean, it, it's, it, it's the reality of it, right? <laughs> but we have to um, we have to involve them. Like, imagine coaching LeBron James and saying, I am – I am Ronald Nord coaching LeBron James, and this is exactly what I'm going to do when I come. This is what my culture is going to look like, and it's just, it's not going to work, right? LeBron has such a power and a weight in the team, for the organization, for the whole league, that you have to go to him and become a partner with him in what's going to happen um, in the culture building. And so I learned that the hard way when I was coaching the G League. My first year as a G League coach, I came in, I said, this is, this is what we're about. Boom, 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 boom. And our players were like... Eh, you know, over the course of the season, they didn't really say that, but over the course of the season, it was like, I mean, all that stuff sounds good, but we're not living that every day. And I did a horrible job, you know, um, um, of making it um, important and finding ways for the for the guys to to um, to take it in as their own. My second year, I was like, uh, we're, we're not going to do it this way. Again, I had a great assistant that, that helped me with this. Um, and we really came to the players. We did a great session. Um, where the players came up with the values of who we're going to be. They came up with four. We said three to four. They came up with those values. They came up with the definitions of those values are. And I was able to, and I agreed with them. They were very good. The coaches were all a part of it. But I was able to, and our whole staff was able to coach them through that. And that's what I mean by evolving the players and how important it is to do that at this level. Um, year one, it was Ronald Nord's words and Ronald Nord's values, which I think are important as the as the head coach especially, but if the players aren't involved in the process, especially at this level, but I think at every level, I don't think it is as meaningful to the players. I, I was just thinking about how even you know, whatever level you're at, and normally it is coaches come in and set the culture. Like literally we have six, we have six words on our wall in our locker room. And I'm, when you, you kind of hit me right in the stuff, I'm wondering how many of those players could care less about those words on the wall because they didn't have anything to do with it. It's just been, now that they're, they're good words, like your four, like right. your four things, when you came in, I'm, I'm pretty sure as a player, I would, cause I was a pleaser. I would have just fallen right in line with no whatever, Same. <laughs> but what's the harm in scraping those words off the wall every year and putting up those that, that the players feel like this is really how we want to show up what we want to do. I, I, that's powerful. Yeah, with and with that too, because um, you know, you know, I, I went to Butler. Butler has six specific, you know, values um, as a part of the men's basketball program. Really, as a part of the athletic department, but as a part of the men's basketball program. And you know, I think I think I mean they're great words. They're fantastic, right? Um, and I think it's good to to have those. Some programs that is just who you are. You know, you have your words on the wall, that, and and you know those don't necessarily need a change, but it's. If I asked every single player what the words are, number one, do you remember all six? First question. If they can't remember all six, you're not good, you're not doing good enough. And number two, if they can't all say when you ask them what they mean as a second question, if they can't all say similar, doesn't have maybe not the exact same word for word thing, but if they can't say uh, similar things, again, I don't think you're driving your culture well enough, and it hasn't been meaningful to them. It's great if our culture is meaningful to us as the coach, but that really doesn't matter. It's it's they're the ones that are playing. They're the one. They're the ones that are living it out. And so even with those words, you know, and I've read, you know, I've read this, and I think it's good. You know, some coaches have their words, and they those are their words. That's what their program is about, and that's great. But team team by team, what those words mean for that team might change year to year. And so let's say one of our words is thankfulness. 
right? Thankfulness for my team this year may look different than, differently in action than what thankfulness will for the team next year. And so I think it's important for us just to come back to our players every year and be really intentional about what it means. Just to say, our program is going to be thankful. You're going to come here and you're going to be thankful. <laughs> I think I think it's be thankful today. <laughs> right. I think it's really difficult, right? Yeah. They have to understand what that is. It's like what we do with our, what we do with our children. Like we tell our children, you know, the different values of, of, you know, our, our family, but you know, why, you know, my four-year-old daughter, she questions everything. Well, why am I doing that? Right. And we have to be really intentional about, helping them understand why we're saying thankfulness, whatever those words are year to year. I love that idea of, you know, in, in effect, quizzing your players, uh, give, give them a written test and, and have the things that you hold dear and important as a coach. Uh, one of the big, our biggest jobs is to communicate that clearly. And, and what I love about PGC is the sticky language, the ability mm-hmm. to remember things. And uh, day, I think it's the last night, before Highlight uh, at Point Guard College, we have uh, a little time for the directors just to talk. And I would always talk, it's about favorites, right? Favorites is one of those things that is, it's real and, and coaches have favorites and it's your right to be a favorite. Well, what it, what does it look like to be a favorite? So I would have the players say, hey, most likely your program has pillars, standards, a culture. Will you write it down, please? And, I, and, and I'd say, raise your hand if you feel like you got it all. I mean, it was less than half of the room mm-hmm. knew exactly. So, yeah, you're right. It's it's on them to know it, but then it's on us to make sure that we're living it out and we're talking about it every day. Can't imagine how hard that is with professionals to do that. That's got to be challenging. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's um, you know, it, it just goes back to just relationships, I think, right? Um, and, and intentionality. Like, I, I know I keep using that word, but, um, if you go a day, you know, back to kind of what you were saying about your group walking, like if you go a day where that's a, that's an important part of your program and you go a day without addressing it, then that's just one less day that you're being intentional about the things that you want to live out. And so we have to do that at this level. And it may look a little different than it does at the high school level or at the college level or, or at the elementary school le- level. Um, but we have to be intentional. And again, the player, the, the buy-in from the players, especially at this level is so important. Yeah. What do you do? Let's just say you have a few, normally have a few individuals that whatever, like you and I, whatever coach you say, I I got it, I'm in there, I'm all in. How do you, especially at that level, bring some of those other players along that maybe they're coming from a tough situation, you know, or just having a bad day, or somehow they've been so talented that those habits have never, they've never been held accountable to those. How do you bring them along? Yeah, that that's I mean, that is <laughs> that is the name of the game at this level. It, it's 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 not easy. But to me, I think it go it goes back to the relationship. You know, the head coach or certain assistant may not have a great relationship with that player. There's one player that I that I've coached in particular that he didn't have a great relationship with almost anybody on the staff. You know, they had a good working relationship, but not like someone he would come to talk to, you know, pour his heart out to. Um, but I was fortunate to have that relationship with him. And so it may look like the head coach saying to me, you know, hey, so and so struggling with this. Um, can we can we figure out what's going on? Or can you can you talk to him? Can you, you know, can we find an interesting strategy, a way to get him on board with what's happening? Um, but I think especially at this level, it goes back to relationships. Our players, because of how much money they make, because of how um how public they are. Um, there's times where they lack trust in, mm. in people and that's understandable. Um, and so to have, to be in the building and have someone they trust and can go to is really important. And we have so many people that are part of our organizations. That person could be the athletic trainer, the assistant yeah. athletic trainer, the, the, the massage therapist. It could be that person. Um, but understanding those key people, um, that are in their lives and being able to speak to them through that person, I think is important as the head coach. Um, but, but even as, you know, other members on the staff. That's a great point. I, it made me think of, uh, I, had, I had the pleasure of talking to Kevin Eastman on here. And golly, I, I don't know. I mean, I've, you're intimidating enough uh, just because <laughs> of who you are and what you do. But then Kevin Eastman and his experience, I just, I, I just, I had to remember like, hey, stay present. Like actually <laughs> ask questions. Don't just, don't just stare at them. Uh, but he had a great point. And along the same lines that you, that you just, and you nailed it. Uh, send messages through other people 
and and it could be actual people. And he act, he would find out. He would ask players, "Who's your favorite? Who do you look up to? What mm-hmm. what professional any sport do you follow?" And if it's Tom Brady, he would go through and find when Tom Brady said something that this player really needed. You mm-hmm. know, need you need to be more, a better communicator with your teammates. He'd find a clip or a message and he'd write it out and he'd give it to him. And like, what a great, but you're saying the same thing. Find yeah. somebody in your organization, you know, as a head coach, it might not be the best thing for it to be always coming from you. Cause man, I, just like we could tune our parents out when we were younger, players can tune us out. And that, that all goes, you know, the overarching thing. And again, this, this is at our level and it, you have to have it at our level. You don't have to have it at, I don't think, you know, college, high school, elementary school, but it's humility, right? It's the humility to understand that it's not about you. Yeah. It doesn't have to be about you. And it's about trying to get the best out of your players. And what is that? I love Coach Eastman's way of doing that. You know, that might be someone else. And one thing that we have here at our level that's great is we have, you know, just being a part of a professional sports organization, you get access to a lot of people, right? And people that you can just kind of call up, <laughs> hey, you know, this is the Indiana of Pacers. And so we can make certain people available to our players that may be a better connection than anybody in the organization um, or has, you know, been on a similar path. You know, this is, this is, this is an example completely different, but something that was cool yesterday was Marcus Smart was the first guard to be named, you know, a defensive player of the year since Gary Payton. Wow. Well, what did the NBA and the Celtics do? They brought Gary Payton to send him the award, right? We have kind of access to people like that. And I think we all do, you know, we have access to other NBA players, but, college programs, high school programs have access to people locally or that have played for the program before, whatever the case may be, that can be great assets for the players. Um, but again, that that comes with a humility from the coach and the coaching staff more than anything else to know. It's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be you that's presenting the message. The Jamoti Podcast is powered by Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans, create huge fundraising opportunities, and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. I've already gone through how well I feel like I know you, even though I'll, I'll know you better after this talk. <laughs> but being so, you, you mentioned this intentional intentionality, you've said that multiple times. What ways or what are your daily habits that set you up for success? Me personally? Yes. Um, I, well, number one is being able to, the best I can, is being able to be just as good of a dad as I am as a coach and a husband as I am as a coach. That's super important to me. And I think if I ever get to a point where I can't do that, then I'm going to find something else to do or find another path to go on because it's, you know, as much as I love basketball, coaching and teaching, it's not worth, you know, I already, we already give a lot of sacrifices with our family, right? With the games and for us, the travel and the season, you know, to, to do it more is just, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you know, my family's number one. So um, I try to create a schedule and I kind of have my way that I, you know, go about it, but I try to create a schedule that's going to allow me um, to be present with my, my kids, four-year-old daughter, one-year-old son, as much as I can when I'm home. And then um, when I'm not home or they're asleep, that's when I do my work. Um, and so for me, r- recently, my daily my habits have been, um, I just started listening to um, uh, the reading of the Bible every morning. Um, I, haven't, I haven't been reading it. I've been listening to it, which has been really interesting uh, yeah. and it's been really cool. So on my way to work, I listened to it. Is, um, do you use the Bible app? No, I actually uh, listened to a podcast. Um, I'm not Catholic, but it's by a Catholic priest. I know who you're talking about. Father uh, Mike. Schmidt. Mike, yeah. 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 His voice, man. <laughs> He's great. And then he has really good feedback and, commentary, and breakdown yeah. commentary. I, yeah. That's good. so good. So, so that's what, so I wake up and, you know, for me, sleep is also very important. I think sleep is, you know, I listened to a podcast by the sleep expert that pretty much said, if you're not sleeping enough, if you're not sleeping, you know, seven to eight hours a night, you're, you're killing, literally killing yourself. You'll, you'll live five to 10 years less. Yeah. It's yes. crazy. Yeah. Yes. So I sleep is important. So I pretty much set my alarm for seven to eight hours after whatever time I go to sleep. Um, 
And so I get that sleep. Sometimes I wake up early. If there was no game the night before, I, I wake up early and I go into the office because it's quiet and I can get some work done. But so I wake up early. I'll go to um, I listen to my listen to the Bible on the way in. I'll get to my desk and I'll you know start my work, whatever my film is. Um, you know, preparing for uh, the next opponent, which is a big part of uh, my job, my role uh, here. And then. Usually by that time, we either have some meetings or some type of discussions to get ready for practice, um, go out to the practice court, uh, you know, and that's how I prepare my drills if I have any that day. Uh, then we'll go out to the practice court and and practice. And, you know, for us, the day is usually over by two o'clock in the afternoon. And so I'm able to come home, spend time with the kids. And then if there's any work that I have to do, you know, after dinner, after the kids go to bed, th then I do that. So that's a you know, non-game day when I'm at home. Um, and it looks pretty similar on the road, and game days are pretty similar as well. You mentioned, uh, you know, basically keeping the main thing the main thing. And the moment that you feel like you, you're you not, like you've kind of lost it, right? Like you you got to redirect. I'm, I'm going through uh, Ecclesiastes right now. And so you got Solomon here, the richest, wisest dude in the world basically talking about how everything that he's strived for, what the people strive for, these earthly successes, he says, it's all vanity. Mm -hmm. Like it's not anything that, that will matter, you know, in the long run. But then, but then there's another side of that, of being excellent with what you do. What, what's that balance of striving for success and climbing a ladder, but then also keeping the main thing, the main thing, how hard is that? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's It's been difficult for me. And, you know, I, I think even <laughs> some people perceive me as like this ultimate like ladder climber. Like I'm always trying to like get to the next thing move because I've had a lot of jobs and, you know, I've been, you know, a coach at every level. Um, and I think early on in my career, I've been coaching. This is my 10th year. I just finished my 10th year coaching. Early on in my career, that was definitely the deal. Like I was just Three like, kids. I got to get it. Yeah, pretty kid. I was just trying to get there, trying to get there, you know. And listen, my ultimate goal is to be a to be a head coach. Um, and um, but you know, I don't go around every day talking about like I'm. I can't wait to be a head coach soon, you know. And to me, it's about daily habits and trying to get better. And um, whatever that whatever that means for that time in that season, sometimes that's like getting better X's and O's. Why? Sometimes that's reading about leadership or culture or teaching. Um, sometimes that's like just trying to figure out how to help the players get better, how to help the players I'm working with get better. And so for me, ultimately, it's about how can I grow the most um, and get better? And, you know, I, I'm a I'm a person of faith. And so to to achieve and, and want to achieve is about using the gifts that, that I believe that God has given me to further his kingdom, ultimately. Right. And so. Um, if I can make it not about me and, 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 and the same thing for my family. Like I, I love working hard and, you know, my, we're a basketball family, but I love working hard and doing the best I can for my wife and my kids. Um, and, and that's important to me. And so um, there are times where I make it about me because I'm not perfect. And I'm like, I want to work hard because I want people to know how hard I work and how, you know, how good I possibly can be. And so that, that definitely creeps in, but that's not the ultimate thing. The ultimate thing is to, grow as much as I can and then use the gifts that I've been given, you know, to, um, you know, make the Lord known and, you know, to do the best for my family and whatever team I'm a part of that, that, that's all that matters to me. I think ultimately it's, it's being the best at where you're at. And when, when people do that, they typically do it. Like I, I would never have thought you as a person that's just climbing, but you, the gifts that you've been given and how hard you work, and the value that you bring, it's amazing how doors open up when, when you do that. No but question. then when, when, when you are a believer, I think your why is just, a, it's just at a different level than just success. But, you know, my point to saying that is, is you're 10, probably around 10 years younger than me or, or close to that. And you're an NBA assistant coach, <laughs> you know, like, like yeah. it's incredible what you've done. You know, I'm 40 years old. And I'm the head coach at Grapevine Faith Christian School. We have 350 kids, but I've never felt called or led to do anything else. Not that I'm not open to it. I've just never felt it. So my, and I, my pastor said this a few weeks ago. 
maybe like the coaches out here that are listening to this that are, are at a smaller school or at a job where there's not that much notoriety in it or maybe we're called to be exactly where we are and and, and that's where it goes back to be the best at where you are and then in your case man I, I I do just from knowing of you and knowing some of your habits even in 30 minutes of talking with you like there's something different something special uh, but I don't know just some thoughts I had while you're talking yeah no and I, I get asked all the time um, by people who want to get to this level or you know want to get to a high level in college basketball um, about like how, how do I do it or can you help me or you know all those things and what's happened for me is if we're being completely honest let's do that I, I went to Butler right I played for Brad Stevens and um, I was fortunate to have a good career and be on a really good team. And I tried to be the best leader I could. I tried to be a great person in the community. And I, I do think that people recognize that in me. And so I was fortunate to get a head coaching job in high school right after I graduated. Um, and then I went and took a college job at the University of South Alabama with a Butler, with, a, with a Matthew Gregg, who was an assistant when I played at Butler. He got the head coaching job, asked me to come with him. And then three months into that, Brad Stevens left the, the uh, Butler to go to the Celtics. And so without Brad going to from, from Butler to the Celtics, my NBA career and where I'm sitting right now, I, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I, 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 don't, I think it's very unlikely. My path would look a lot different. And so for me, without that foot in the door, I, I, I don't, I'm not sitting where I am, right? Yeah. And so to be in that organization – and then get to know some people in the NBA. And again, I, my first year, there's a guy who's a really good friend of mine now that told me my first year, my first full year in the NBA, he's like, you're not working hard enough. And he's, he was correct. He was 100% correct. You're not working hard enough. This isn't what it's about. You're just kind of living the NBA life and enjoying being in the NBA. This is about work. To stay around the NBA, you got to work. Mm -hmm. And I really took that and I, and I applied that, right? And I just tried to work as hard as I could. And I think people saw that. So I've been able to make other connections that, got me the opportunity to be, an, to, to be a G League head coach. And then a guy that was there in Brooklyn knew the coach of Charlotte. And when Char the coach of Charlotte got the job, he allowed me to go there, right? Um, and uh, there was a connection with Coach Carlisle. And so when Coach Carlisle got this job, he was like, without that, none of this is possible. Um, I could be the greatest coach in the world. But without those connections to get me to where I am, none of this is possible. And so I tell anybody that asks, how do I do it? How do I get there? it is important that you do the best job you can right where you're sitting right now. Because the, the people that you're around every day are the people that can speak to your ability to yeah. do whatever the next job is better than anyone else. And I, so I tell people, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's a, there's a kid that I coached when I was in high school, when I was coaching high school that um, is coaching college. He's trying to, you know, move up as he should. And, he wants to he wants to see if I can help. And I said, I, I'm more than happy to help you. But I have not. I don't talk to you all the time. I have not worked with you since you were a ninth grader and I and I was coaching you. So I can't lend as much as your head coach that you work with currently there can. And so if we're always thinking about what's next, what's next, and we're not putting it like, just like I was my, my first year at the Celtics, we're not putting the time in and the work in, then we're not, we, you know, it's going to be hard for other people to vouch for our ability to move up. And so uh, I, that's that's my for any young coaches or high school coaches or, you know, middle school coaches that want to achieve or want to, you know, get to college or get to the NBA. Do the best job you can where you are, because those people can help you out more than anybody else can. And, you know, you did you did have some incredible experiences and not it's not luck. I mean, you and I know it's not luck. Right. The, the situation that you were in in college, who you're able to work for. Uh, and then what he saw. But so you've had some of these gifts, but your character is what allowed you to actually maximize those gifts. And I'm, I'm thinking back to uh, my experience at Baylor and the bad habits that my senior year, I played for Coach Drew his mm -hmm. first year at Baylor. We only had six scholarship players after everything bad that happened there. I was one of those groups in some anger and, and resentment and bitterness acquired really bad habits that it was all, it was basically just poor character 
Mm. If I would have been uh, catapulted to a position too early in a time or a place where my character would have wouldn't have allowed me, I would have failed. If I would have been a GA there, or if I would have come back home and been a head coach right after that, I mean, my twenties were a train wreck. Mm. And so, my there a part of the brilliance in your story is not just this accelerated path that you're on that you were on but the fact that your character allowed you to be successful because those your story isn't the one that we hear very much the story we hear or we see movies on or are these companies that are these churches that have the big time ceo charismatic but or but the character of that individual doesn't match up with the level of opportunity that they've been given and they fall. So I, I think it's really cool to see it all work out for you, but man, a little bit of your, of your experience and, and the, and, and those uh, opportunities, but your character is, is impressive. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. I, I, I was thinking about that, the, you know, just the charismatic leaders that we've seen kind of, have too much too soon. And there's a, there's a woman on our staff. She's actually, uh, she has a great connection with PGC, Jenny Busek. She tells me all the time, you don't want to get a job, a head coaching job before you're ready. God's going to put you there when it is your time. If you get one before you're ready, it, it, it's not going to go well. And that's a constant. It's, and it's, it's good. Like, I'm, I'm thankful that she's here. It's a constant reminder for me, but it, it is so true um, because we, we see that all the time. And uh, it's, you know, it makes for interesting stories to listen to and to learn from, but I don't think you want to live it out. <laughs> well, it's so much better to learn from others' mistakes. Being around all of those uh, coaches and, and players that you've had the opportunity to, what are some qualities that you see that great leaders have in common. Yeah, I, I, I've said it a couple of times already, but I think humility is number one. Um, I think to understand that it's it's not about us um, and to live that out, I think is is so important and live that out in your, in, in your behaviors, right? We've got to talk about culture, but um, to understand like, how can I make this about other people first? Um, I think it's important. Second thing for me, and it kind of goes along with that, is just the service to, to others. Um, we are literally in a position as, as coaches to where we're trying to get the most out of the people that we coach. And um, to give to them, I think, is so, like, not take, like, at our level especially, right? Like, people want to take, people want to be around the great player. They want to do it, and they want to, you know, they want to be seen in the picture with the great, and I, that, that's, it can't be about that. It's about... How can we give ourselves to the players? Um, I can't remember the exact metaphor, but it's that metaphor of like, uh, you know, filling up other people's buckets, right? Like, you, you, you know, you have your you have your bucket. We all have our buckets and taking out your water from your bucket and dumping it into other people's buckets. I, I think about that, not all the time, but I think about that from time to time. Am I literally like taking water out of my bucket, my soul? Am I taking that out and giving it to um, someone else? So I think... I think that's important. The humility, the ability, the the humility to know it's not about you, and then the ability to to serve other people is important. And I think working the work, but efficiently, I think is super important of great leaders. Understanding kind of whatever your, you know, whatever your, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, content uh, is is about right. Understand your exes for basketball for basketball coaches are X and O's. For leaders, it's the, it's the, you know, the leader, the business, I mean, for uh, business people, it's the, the business strategies, wherever that right. is. Understanding that content and being able to, um, to efficiently work at it. You got to be competent, right? Like you've got to be competent in what you're doing or else take your talent and everything, <laughs> how well you communicate if it's crap and if it's not believable and it's not going to help somebody, it's not going to come, it's going to yeah, fall on their ears. Doesn't matter, right? Um, and so I, I, I think that's an important thing. And then the last piece I'll say, and I, I think this kind of goes in all of it, all of the leadership, but like your communication and your ability cr to create clarity in your organization is so important. Your ability to communicate clearly uh, for, for whoever you're leading to understand what you're saying and what you're trying to get across to be um, to remove emotion and not be not not be emotionless 
but to remove emotion from your communication and be clear about what you're saying. And at times that's screaming, yeah. right? At who you're at who you're communicating with. <laughs> but a lot of times it's not, right? Um, but I think if you come in with one day you're really high and you're you're communicating from a happy place and then you lose a game and you come the next day and you're really sad. I think that that wears on the people that you're around. Consistency, man. The consistency, consistency of your communication and who you are is important. And then the ability to create clarity. I think yeah. this is a big area that coaches struggle um, in. And, you know, coaches I've seen have been around uh, from time to time is the people that we lead don't understand their roles. Because, again, it goes back to intentionality. We don't tell them or come to an agreement on what that role should be. And so we come into the season and we have all these great plans. And a lot of times it's not, you know, we're not doing it on purpose, but um, we come to the season, we have all these great plans. This is the offense we're going to run. This is the defense that we're going to do. These are out of bounds plays. Even this is our great culture that we're going to have. And you just do it, but you never take the time to sit down with the, every individual and say, this is exactly what, you know, I expect your role is going to be. I expect from you. This is what we're going to celebrate you doing. And this is ultimately what we're going to hold you accountable to um, for each individual, not as a team, but each individual, I think is so important because what I've seen as an assistant coach is players get lost in it, right? They're like, they're upset because, oh, I should have come in, you know, for, you know, with our rotations and things like that in the NBA. I thought I should have come in at that time. Or why is so-and-so taking these shots and I can't? Or why did he? Talk, why did the coach talk to this guy this way and not and not and you know talk to me this way? And there's just a lot of questions about like players lacking understanding of what they should be doing, you know, and and who they should be as a part of the team. And so I think creating that ultimately is it makes and, and even with and I think I'm just rambling here, but your staff too, yeah, right. Your staff has to understand what their roles are, what you expect from them. Um, and what you're going to hold them accountable to. And then you got to hold them accountable to it. I did a horrible job of that my first year as a head coach in the G League. No clarity, no accountability, and everybody was just upset, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then it came back on me, and I was upset that they were upset, and they couldn't get it. Why can't they get it? Well, it was my fault because I didn't create clarity for them. Um, so, you know, the, the humility, the service, uh, the ability to be consistent in your communication, um, to know what you're talking about, create clarity, I think, you know, are, you know, there are many aspects of leadership, but some that stick out to me. Man, such great stuff and, and so much to unpack there. But I'll, I'll just try to choose a few things. Uh, one, great reminder for every coach at every level about clarity and roles and communicating that with your players. I, I overlook my assistants quite a bit if they were on here now. I'm at, I'm at I'm at a small private school. They're part-time guys. They have other jobs. And I think uh, maybe knowingly or unknowingly, I give them less responsibility or I, I don't have as high of expectations because they're volunteering, they're part-time, or the stipend's really small. But then I wonder, I mean, how many of them are wanting more? But there's just no communication. So that's a really good reminder for every coach at every level to have those one-on-ones with coaches and players. And then the second thing, and then I want to dive into this a little bit more. Uh, I think I love the fact that you mentioned some of the things that players struggle with in the NBA, because it's the same things that the high school kids are struggling with. Oh, no. So, I mean, a little bit of weight off of our soldier, uh, shoulders as coaches that, that even the best of the best in the world that their craft struggle but 82 games, how hard, like what allows people to be consistent with how they show up every day with that type of grind? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's really hard. Um, I think over time you get, you, you kind of get used to what the calendar and the schedule looks like. But the ones to point out to your question, to answer your question, the best are first and second year players, right? Because they're going from college or overseas, whatever the case may be, where they're just coming in. Everybody talks about the rookie wall, right? And that the rookie wall is real. There comes a point in the season, your rookie year, it doesn't matter how good you are, where you're just, you're just gassed. I mean, you're like, how much more can I have? Your body's beat up. You are, you have mentally gone through 
you know, depending on where you are organizationally, some organizations, you know, you know, the top picks aren't are playing for teams that struggled the year before and yeah. you know, yeah. maybe struggling their that first year as well. You know, the middle rounds are like teams that are pretty good and their roles are sometimes they play a lot and then sometimes they don't play very much. And then kind of the end of the first round are the good or the best teams, right? So these rookies are getting drafted and they may not be playing at all. They may be in the G League the whole year. And so you're dealing with like a lot of varying factors in what a rookie and second year player, what they deal with. Um, and it's hard. It's great to have what really helps is to have great veterans that can that are um, intentional about being with the players, uh, the young guys that help them along, that, you know, um, help them see what's important, help them just say, hey, <laughs> this is a time. You know what? We all went through this. You just got to fight through it. Right. But ultimately. It's the daily habits of the players. It is the guys that can just come in every single day. They come in, they get their treatment, they take care of their bodies, they get their lifts, uh, they come in, they get their work on the court, they eat right, they do the right things at night. Uh, the guys that can do that consistently throughout the course of the year are the guys that end up, you know, doing doing well uh, throughout the course of that season. Um, the guys that, you know, and the guys that, or, you know, something's happening at home where it's a difficult time at home or they're not eating well or um, they're not getting a lot of sleep. Those guys, those guys tend to struggle and they have a little bit more, you know, fluctuation in who they are on a day to day basis than the guys that can just day by day. Good habits. Right. And they're learning for our guys. They're learning these habits. They're learning, you know the free time that they're having, you know, it's different when in college, when you go on the road, you're like, you have a team meal, you have a team film session the night before you have those. In the NBA, we get to the hotel and you just, you got, you're just whatever, right? Yeah. It's just like being at home. You just do whatever. And so the guys that understand the discipline of just all those little small habits are the guys that make it through the season, you know, pretty, pretty well, even, even with hitting the rookie wall, they just kind of keep on, man, I've hit a wall. They just keep on going. Um, and again, I think over time, you know, a 10 year vet understands what that looks like. So it's a little easier for them. And they understand, you know, JJ Reddick has the same routine that he did every single day, right? He got to that point eventually. And so it's a, for us as coaches, it's about teaching our players those things. Like, how can you create a routine that's going to allow you to be successful every day, regardless of like how the season is going or your playing time, whatever the case may be? What about the coach's wall? Because and I, it's something I don't think I've ever really heard of or or because you usually only hear from players. Right? And so I've heard of rookies struggling a little bit with time, but it's an 82 game season for coaches also. And you, you know, so we play 30 to 35 games in Texas because we, we I don't know, everything's bigger here. So we play, sure. we play we play some more games, we do all this stuff. But I even find sometimes like it's a four month season. Like, all right, another game, tournament games. You know, this is our second game today. And 82 games, what's that wall like for you guys? It's a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot. Like, truthfully, it's a lot. Um, and, again, you get used to it. Um, and you find your places where you get more rest and you're looking at your schedule and things like that where you can, you know, if you're an assistant coach and you are doing opponent scouting, you might have – three consecutive games where you're scouting the upcoming opponent and that's hard right but then you go a couple games where you don't have and you can kind of not that you you know necessarily take a break but you're able to just breathe a little bit um but there's there's, there's a ton of film there's a ton of travel you're always on the plane and you know we do travel nice you know but you're getting in at you're getting in at 2 a.m you yeah, know how nice and, the plane was doesn't change the fact that it's 2 a.m <laughs> exactly. It never, never changes. Right. Um, and then, you know, the hard part about that is like you get to the airport and you drive home and you're, you know, when you're driving, when you're driving, you're awake. Right. So you're wired. So then you get home at two thirty and you're wired and you got to find a way to calm your body down and get some sleep. But I think similar to the players habits, the coaches have to have to have those habits, too. You know, I kind of talked about it when you asked me about my habits. I have my way that I schedule my day yeah. um, so I can maximize being a coach and being a being a dad and a husband. And. A lot of coaches, you know, we all we all kind of figure that out, what that looks like for us. Um, and so, but that sleep, kind of the same thing. Sleep is so important. Um, the coaches that don't sleep, they get sick. 
Um, they get tired. They get worn down. They'll whatever say the case something. Be. Say something they regret that they can't pull back. Exactly. No that, th- those habits are just as important for us as as they are for the players. And so, uh, eating well, sleeping well, um, having your routine, whatever that looks like for your schedule uh, with you and your family, um, understanding when you can watch film, when you don't watch film, those kind of things are important. And so. Uh, it's a lot, though. I mean, it's a lot. We're, we're gone a lot. We're, we're on a lot. We're working a ton. Uh, I coach at all level working a ton, but you, you throw in 82 games in a tightly packed window. It's yeah. a lot. And what was what was interesting, what was interesting about this year, especially for me, you know, we all everybody on our staff got COVID um, at, one, at some point this year. And we got 12 days of not working every single day. Right. We're still in Zooms with our staff. We're still watching our games when we're away from the team. But it, it was a learning opportunity for me. Like if I ever become a head coach, there's something to giving your staff like a day or two or like, hey, just stay home. Be with yeah. your family. Um, I know uh, you got to kind of clear that with your bosses. But there's something to that um, because it was really enriching for me to be able to be home with my kids. Now it's 12 days. I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give your staff <laughs> 12 days, but a day or two to do that and to be, to come back refreshed, you know, Hey, I don't want you to watch any film. You know, uh, I don't want you to do any work. I just want you to be with your family. And then when you do that, you come back refreshed and ready to go. So I think there's something to that, but it was an interesting thing, you know, thinking about the coaches. Yeah. Ball with COVID. I, I think, I think obviously if we could choose between, pandemic no pandemic we choose no like yeah. nobody's uh, but and there were some really tough times and people struggled during that but there were also some areas that I feel like we grew and we were able to become more efficient like there, there's probably so many times in meetings or things that we just do because we've always done them but mm-hmm. this forced us to see uh find a different way and like for me parent meetings uh at the beginning of the season is always a little bit stressful getting the notice out to everybody. Can everybody make it? Can everybody make it up to the gym? Uh, we, we started to do it on Zoom. I had the most parents ever attend a parent meeting ever wow. on that <laughs> Zoom. So even if things, I mean, ever get back to whatever normal means, we're still going to Zoom that parent yep. meeting because it's the most efficient way to do it. So I do think, I agree with you, there are some things that we learned from it that are good and we'll stick with. Definitely. Coaches, the Jamoti podcast is powered by Biology. What's your BSA score? The Biology Skill Assessment is the only verified skills metric endorsed by the NIA and NJCAA to discover and develop the best talent for your team. This 10 minute, 100 shot test can be taken for free today on the Biology mobile app. Elevate your game. Being a, being a man of faith, how hard is it to coach at the level that you coach and I when I, I say that there's this idea out there that I mean even at the high school level to if you want to be a great coach and, or hard a hardcore coach or a real coach and you see these videos of of high school teams just getting cussed out and then you'll see comments below it that's right that's real coaching yeah I'll I'll go through a brick wall for that dude yeah. And so being a man of faith and, and at that level, how hard is it to be a believer there, stay true to your values and yourself? I'm not saying there aren't other believers around, but in that world, that culture, what are your thoughts? Yeah, the, I think the most difficult thing is just the level of distraction um, that happens at, at our level. Um, there's a lot happening all the time. I mean, the reality about the NBA level is it's an entertainment business. Um, and when, it, when entertainment becomes money, becomes you know, uh, attractive people from the opposite sex, um, and all those things. It, it becomes uh, pride, um, ego, and so those things are. It, it can be. A, it can be a lot. Um, and um, not to mention just like trying to just be a great coach. And you know, I won't sit here and say like I've, I've never cussed at a player. Or, you know, uh, I haven't said something to a player that I'm like, oh man, <laughs> you know, I go home and I'm like. <laughs> Uh man, I really, I really screwed up on that one. That's <laughs> yeah. you know that that happens more often than it probably should. But um, you again, I think it goes back to understanding who you are and understanding. You know, my mom used to say, "Where you come from," you know, and um, 
and about being intentional about being in the word. And again, it's something that, um, that I don't do great. And, you know, I talked about, um, you know, listening to Father Mike, yeah. uh, shout out to Father Mike. I don't know if Father Mike listens to this podcast, but uh, I hope you do. Um, li- listening to him, it, it's, it's been really, really good for me. Um, I, I want to, we had a great, um, we had a great series at our church right when we moved here. So this would have been in September or something. Um, and I can't even remember the name of it. And I should, it's really bad that I can't, but um, part of it was about just what's happening in our culture, right? Politically and racially and all these different things. And one thing that really sticks out to me about that was when our pastor, Aaron Brockett, talked about our consumption, what we consume. And it's interesting to think about. We go to church, and my church is like an hour and 15. So I go to church for about an hour and 15. Um, you know, if you, if you go to your community group throughout the week, that's another maybe hour that's two hours. Um, and then if you're in your, if you're in the word every day, you know, for, let's say, I don't know, 30 minutes a day, let's say that's, uh, you know, that's, let's see, that's, uh, three and a half more hours throughout the week. So now we're talking five and a half hours out of the week. You are focused squarely on your faith, right? And you're consuming the word, you're consuming the Lord. Well, there's a lot of hours left in the week. Yeah. And we fill that up with Twitter. We fill it up with Instagram. We fill it up with all these things that are really forming us and how important it is that we're feeling, how important it is as a believer to fill up, fill up ourselves with being formed to the scripture, to being formed and look more like Jesus is, has to be the priority. And that's something that, you know, I just, because of how much work, you know, there's just so much work and I always like, I got to work. And then when I'm not working, I got to be with my family. And, you know, and then when I'm on the road, like I'm just scrolling through Twitter. Well, how much of my time is being formed to Jesus and um, being formed to or, or uh, consuming uh, content that's going to help me grow my faith? Yeah. And so that's I think that's something that I'm like constantly on, you know, a journey I'm constantly on. But I think that's number one to being able to be a good coach um, and number one, to be a believer at all levels, but especially at this level where there's so many distractions, there's so much room to say, I'm a 32 year old NBA coach. Look at me, you know, um, to say, and again, I, there's times where I have those thoughts, right? Because like I sit there on the NBA bench and, you know, people are like, Ron Nord, Hey, I remember you from Butler. Like that feels good. To yeah. Me, you know? Yeah. Um, but that, that can't be, that can't be the main thing. Um, and so, um, to understand, uh, to understand those distractions, I think it's really important. Um, and to be able to be formed, to look more like Jesus, I think overcomes all those ultimately, not to say we don't struggle with them, but ultimately yeah. it's going to overcome all those. A big thing that you kind of mentioned is, is choice. Like you don't choose necessarily, you know, who is in that locker room every day and, you know, and, and who you have to be around at work. Uh, you do get to choose your family and, and being around them, but that's a good choice. And then you got to sleep and you choose to go to church, but there's this all other, this time that we're choosing what we put in our mind. And that's the part where we got to check ourselves. Like, why am I choosing mm. the distractions over things that will build me up as a person, build me up as a believer? I know for me, I've chosen just to put on the office or to put on something, just this distraction most of the time, because I don't want anything to force me to deal with issues that I have going on. Mm-hmm. Those yeah. distractions are, I, I believe they you know, are, are we're, we're driving our car, having something going. And, and even if it's not the Bible, like on, that's a good choice. I'm choosing sports TV or something with something with politics just to distract me from the, maybe what's going on inside. I don't know if you've ever felt like that. Yeah, no, there's, there's, there's no doubt about that. I think, and I think that's what work is for me, really, you know, that work becomes that can become that for me where, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm just going to watch a lot of film and I'm going to work really hard. It's distracting from, you know, I was not a very good person or I said, like, kind of like I said, I said something wrong to a player. Um, And I think along with this is, is just what we say, you know, what we're saying on a daily basis um, to the people that we're around, you know, is what I'm saying 
reflecting the fact that I'm a believer, <laughs> you know, and there are, yeah. there are certain what times. Evidence, what evidence is there? And you know, I, I talked to my players about this the other day. Not, sorry for cutting you off. Oh, you're fine. So, I got so excited. Uh, I talked to the players the other day, like, guys, I know you go to a Christian school. What evidence is there no of doubt. your faith? No like, doubt. how would people know if they didn't know? Is it just the fact that you go to Grapevine Faith? Yeah. Or is it within your speech? If they turned your car on, what comes on? Uh, yeah. If they go through your phone, what's your, the history? Like, how would they know? It's interesting. Yeah. That, and that's that's so huge. And I, I know that's something that I, that I always am thinking about growing in, right, is what I'm saying around the facility, who I'm acting like, you know, how I'm acting around the facility. Um, and I, I think that's I think that's so important. It's, you know, our speech is just a window into who we are. Right. And um, and our actions are as well, kind of what you're saying. And so that's an area for me that, you know, uh, there's a lot of crazy things that are said <laughs> and at all levels. You know, in the NBA, there's a lot of crazy things that are said. And, you know, I can participate in it or I can, you know, stand up to it or, you know, um, or I can, you know, change the conversation or. Um, and, and so those are, you know, those are things that I'm always that's always conscious in my mind what my speech is like. And it's it's an area, quite frankly, that I, I need to get better at and I want to continue to improve at. Talked a lot about your personal growth and, and culture and things that, that, that you believe in. What are some of the coaches and leaders that you follow and that you learn from? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the first one for me is, is Brad Stevens. He's, you know, and, you know, we have a great relationship. He let me live with him when I was uh, coaching in uh, coaching in Boston. So, but but him just as a leader is is huge. Um, so so he's one. Um, Simon Sinek. I love to read uh, Simon Sinek stuff. He is fantastic. Um, just with business and um, one of his great books is Start with Why. Uh, I kind of go. You, you mentioned it um, just as a believer, but in general, like yeah, know your um, why. Talks yeah. about the greatest company is just. The greatest companies start with their why, right? Their mission, um, not with their what. And a lot of us start with what we do, not why we do. Um, but he's got a lot of other really good content. Um, a guy that this is a, a guy that, and, and as you'll see with my answers, I, I I like I like listening to coaches, but I really like listening to people in business and and other things like that. Um, uh, Doug Lamoff, um, who I'm sure you, you, I know of Doug or you've read some of his stuff. Um, the coach's guide to teaching was like the best book ever. I haven't read that yet, but you're probably, you're, uh, there's been a few coaches that have mentioned that book. So it's in the cart on Amazon. And whenever my wife says I can, I can go ahead and get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. It is the real deal. Um, as far as, being a coach, but also understanding how we can teach at the highest level. And, you know, he's a, um, you know, he's a teacher by trade and runs a teaching consultant business. And so he has a lot of evidence to uh, best practices in teaching. Um, so, uh, you know, you teach, actually teach. Uh, we actually, I mean, we teach too on the court, but, you know, my teaching is, is just with our players. So I, I need to learn how to, you know, we don't do best practice we're not going through teaching seminars <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis at the NBA level. So learning how to do that is important. Um, so uh, th those three guys for sure. And then – Let me ask um, you a question about that. Yeah. How many how many coaches – and obviously you don't want to uh, name any names, but how many coaches at your level do struggle? They have a lot of head knowledge and they know a lot, but they do struggle with saying it clearly or, or unpacking it in a way that will help players. I would, I'll answer that question by saying um, more than you probably would imagine. Um, and, and I don't think, it, I, you know, I don't look at it as necessarily a negative. I think it's just yeah. lack of um, learning about teaching yeah, um, or using best teaching practices. I was really fortunate because I studied to be an elementary school teacher. Um, and so not to say I'm the greatest teacher ever, but I have a background in teaching. Um, that's really helped me. Um, it's amazing how similarly five-year-olds elementary school kids are to NBA players. And so um, <laughs> so using some of those things that I learned as a student at Butler University, um, College of Education has helped me apply it to coaching the NBA now. Um, and so uh, that and then, you know, 
I, I like a lot of my content that I take in or leaders that I look at are just through, you know, I read a ton of articles about, uh, I love coaching changes and things like that because I can just learn about different coaches and what they believe in. So I like to consume that, but then just like to read different books about, you know, different leaders. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to start one about soon about Angela Merkel or Angela Merkel. I should say she was, she's a chancellor of Germany and her whole like thing is about is, um, I think she may be done as the chancellor of Germany now, but, or she's on her way out, but she's not a charismatic person at all, but she's a great leader. And so wow. there's something that's there uh, that has made her a successful leader. Um, so reading, you know, biographies or books like that as well, have, is something that I enjoy doing. Um, and then I listen to a ton of podcasts. I mean, Anybody that knows me, uh, like my brother was just here the other day and we a couple of talk, topics were brought up. And I was like, I got a podcast for that. Oh, you want to talk about sleep? I got a podcast for that. Oh, multitasking? Podcast for that. I got a podcast for that. <laughs> so that is, that is, that's a big part of, uh, that's a big part of, uh, you know, just me learning and growing. Like Adam Grant's podcast is really good. Sorry, my son is. Uh, what's, what's he do? Adam, what's Adam Grant? Adam Grant is an organi organizational psychologist. Okay. Um, and he works at the University of Pennsylvania at Penn. Um, and so he has a podcast called Work Life that is literally about, you know, balancing work and life. Um, and so just different strategies that you learn from the, uh, the Harvard uh, Business Review has a great podcast, like things like that, that um, are really good that um, that I enjoy listening to. You know, you nailed it about the, the teaching part. And because you know, now that my son is going through select ball even a little bit more, you know, and I get to be around some of these organizations that have guys that play, they played in, they were really good high school players, some even college players, you know, uh, that, that are coaching these teams. And, and I, I am, I sit there in the stands and I'm, I'm very uh, polite and kind, but there, there's a level of teaching sometimes that is missing. So just because you played or just because you, you know, been around it for a while. And, and this, again, this is going to sound like a, 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 a a commercial for PGC, but it's not in mono. If you're, if you're listening, like I, I still, I'm still a huge fan of you guys. And, but uh, you know, I went there after you know, playing and then coaching already for uh, it was about six years at that point. And I kind of already had my habits and the way that I like to speak. Mm -hmm. And he dismantled my very first court session it, talk, it gave me all of the – wrote down all of the filler words that, mm. as coaches, we say things like, you got that? You got that? I was saying that after everything. You got that? Does that make sense? Or does that make sense? Mm -hmm. that make, he was like, do you really want them to answer you? Or are you just saying that? You know, like things like that that are incredible teaching points. So to coaches out there, if you had never observed a PGC session, to me that it's even better for coaches to go to them than just players. And again, PGC, I love you. Yeah, I, I agree that the, the teaching uh, component is so important um, because again, our, our goal as coaches is, is to get the best out of the players, right? And so to have to, to know affecting teaching strategies is, is so important. Um, Shaka Smart said something to me. I was at one of their practices. It was, I'm sorry, it wasn't Shaka Smart. It was a guy that Shaka Smart hired when he was at Texas that helped him be a better teacher, better leader that he worked with regularly. And the guy said, you know, <laughs> you know, the problem with you good players is that you guys don't know how to teach yeah. to the other players, you know, the guys you coach. And sometimes the most, the best players and the most coachable players are the ones that struggle to teach other players when they become coaches. Why? Number one, as the best player, you can do everything or you were, you had the ability to do a lot and it's hard for you to relate to someone who can't do as much as you could. Right. And so a lot of people say, just do it harder. Just try harder. Right. Well, if, um, if I'm a, if I'm a, uh, a kindergarten teacher and my student is struggling to add two plus two, I'm not going to tell them just do it harder. <laughs> that's not, that's, that's just not an effective teaching yeah. strategy. Yeah. Right. We have to find a way as a coach to make it real and relevant for to help them understand how to do it better. Um, as the most coachable players, sometimes we show, you know, as uh, 
if we were the most coachable uh, player on our team, when we become coaches, we struggle as well. Why? Because we were the most coachable. So now we're working with guys who aren't or girls that aren't very coachable, right? Yeah. And we can't understand how to help them be coachable. Everyone should be coachable. I was coachable. Everyone should be this way. And that's that's not the reality. Um, and to me, again, that goes back to a lot of relationships and understanding how to build great relationships with people and the players. But having those effective uh, teaching strategies to help people who are struggling in some way break out of that struggle and just get a little bit better is, is a massive part of our job. Coaches, the Jamoti Podcast is sponsored by 3 on 3 Hoops Hub. 3 on 3 Hoops Hub has run over 350 3 on 3 basketball leagues for kids since 1997. 3 on 3 is the ideal format for players to get a lot of opportunities, work on all skills and positions, and have fun with their friends. Whether you want to build your program, raise some funds, or start your own business, you can bring 3 on 3 to your community and do it like an expert by learning from the best with 3 on 3 Hoops Hub's free 90-minute training. You can register at the link in the show notes. Analytics really taken over and it's trickled down you know especially with with companies like huddle that for high school coaches we can you know send our film off we get it back and we have all these stats and it looks more than i ever dreamt of even caring about right how in, i mean obviously it's important in the nba what are some of the good things that analytics bring and then if in your opinion if if you've seen what are some negatives that focusing on it can bring at your level? Yeah, I love analytics. I'm 100% in with analytics. I believe in it. Um, I think it's important. Um, um, I think the coaching, and, and the way that I kind of phrase it is like, I think the coaching, there's an art to coaching, but there's also a science to coaching. And the analytics kind of brings in the science. We as coaches, you know, we, we formulate the art, the, the leadership, the culture, the teaching, all that thing, those things we've been talking about. The, the analytics bring in the science to support, and I think they, they have to support one another. It's not about just having this great art and having this great feel all the time, which I think is great to have the great feel as a coach, but it's also not about just like, we're going to just go strictly off the numbers. I think to do it the best, you, you bring those both together. So for me, um, using analytics, you know, two ways, number one, with our opponents, and number two, with our, with our own team. Um, with the opponents, for me, I, I start from an analytic profile. So we actually have a great group of guy, analytics guys that create um, a profile for every team that we play against. And so um, there's a whole list of stats and things like that that, you know, they do for us and that we can see. And so I look at that first. That's the first thing I look at. If, if I'm getting prepared to play the Chicago Bulls, I'm going to know what the Bulls are by what I see on the sheet first. And then I'll watch the film and see how that matches up. And I wish that was my great strategy that I came up with on my own. Brad Stevens did that. That's that, that's where it came from. And it's really worked for me. It may not work for everyone. People do it differently. Um, but I love taking in all the numbers and understanding a team profile analytically before I watch them on film. Um, because if I can know a team's, you know, a team's shooting profile, right? So 35% of their shots are threes, you know, 20% of their shots are at the rim. And, you know, the other, my math quickly is 55%. 45% of their shots are coming from mid-range. I have a good idea about what I'm about to watch, right? Oh, okay, DeMar DeRozan, he shoots a lot of mid-range jump shots. That's where it's coming from. So that's got to be a big part of our, our game plan. So that's kind of how I think about analytics from an opponent standpoint. Analytics for a team, for me, um, in my role now, um, a lot of the, the things that I do analytically are if we're struggling with something or if I see something that's consistent, we have a great resource that um, that is called Second Spectrum that it has everything you could possibly think of. If you want to go watch Brad Stevens out of bounds plays um, when he was down three with one second left, one second left in his eight years coaching the Celtics, you can just go boom, 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 and it'll just pull up a video. All oh, my goodness. And then if you want to see what the statistics on those were, you click a different thing and you get the same kind of profile. And so we can just, I mean, we can pull, there's so much, right? And I think that's where the negative part comes in. There's so much that you could overdo it. And so if you don't have your system or if you don't have what's important to you and you just focus on those things, it can become too much. The other thing that I think is a negative with analytics is um, when we as coaches overuse it to make our points. Um, 
you know, it, it, we, we have to do that again. If, if there's a, if there's, and that's what I was saying about our, like my role with our team, if there's something that we're struggling with, I'll go find some analytics and I will present it to our coaching staff and present it to coach Carlisle, whoever the case may be and say, Hey, here's what I'm seeing. Like the last 10 games, this has been a trend or whatever the case may be, but that, at times can become a negative if all the coaches are doing it and it's just about me my ideas my points then you know it's you know the analytics are it's it's, it's not a positive thing for the team and so um i've seen that used from time to time on staffs um you know i believe this you know a coach has been saying this over and over again the rest of the staff is like ah uh, and then they just keep hitting you with the analytics of it it's like well you know we've already kind of said we're, we're kind of past that like let's move on um but i love analytics i am 100 percent in and um you know i think just being clear about what you what you value what you need to see and how you're going to use it i think is the right way to do it and and us trying to become complete coaches i think you nailed it you can have too much art but if you don't look at the numbers at all you'll fail you can have all numbers, but if you don't have art to what you're doing, you'll fail. So bringing those two together and then be knowing who you are. You kind of mentioned system. Knowing and choosing the right system for your players and then building and finding the analytics that, that show and help them to get there quicker with their understanding. I think that that's kind of where – because you can – I can pull analytics from uh, not just an NBA team, but the best high school team. If yeah. my makeup or my players are way different than that, then that's not helpful at all, you know, sharing that no, no. information with them. Yeah, and, and, you know, one thing for us with the players, you know, what, what do you share with the with the players? Um, and I, I we had a great guy that uh, – well, we had a great guy, Charlotte, that I worked with that kind of did our coaching analytics. And he used to always talk about what is digestible. Like, what can the players understand and digest? So, for instance, um, at certain places, we've used field goal percentage when we're talking about opponents. Um, and in other places, we've used what we call points per shot. It's the exact same thing in a different way. But helping the players understand, if we're going to use field goal percentage and we're going to call a guy a hot shooter, well, they have to understand what number are we considering a hot shooter? 38% is that hot? So that they can say, they can, you know, we put something up in the locker room and they can go and see, okay, a guy shooting 40%, he's pretty hot. A guy shooting 31%, he's not as hot, right? So how do we even teach our players about analytics and the analytic and, and how we're going to, um, how we're going to present it to them? Yeah, clarity, I think right? it's really important. That's what you're, I mean, you've mentioned clarity a ton. That, that It seems like you, you really need it there or else it can be, uh, misused quickly. Yeah. What the, the players are like, I don't, I don't understand this. I don't even care, you know? Um, so I, I think that's super important. I just, I don't know why my brain just went to Moneyball is one of my favorite movies. And I, I like the way that they, you know, viewed offense. I think in basketball, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a three point guy and, and, and really love using that as a weapon, but it was that point in Moneyball where, uh, you know, Brad Pitt's character brings the guy, the analytic guy in, and he starts talking about stuff, and you can just see the other assistants glaze <laughs> over. Like, yeah, we got to be careful with that, that moment. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right, man. So a lot of a lot of people from PGC and, and in the NBA know you and from college, so you're all over the place. But <laughs> now, after the speed round, we're going to really know who you are. You ready? Quick question. I think so. All right. Favorite ice cream flavor? Cookies and cream. For a high school, shot clock or no shot clock? Shot clock. Texting or talking? Uh, talking. A lot of people say it depends on who it is because well, that, that's that's kind of why I hesitated. <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> I like talking in person, but I don't like talking on the phone. So I would rather text than talk on the phone. All right, there you go. That's a good uh, favorite holiday. Uh, Got to be Christmas. Invisibility or super strength? Invisibility. If you could travel back in time, what period would you go to? I would go to, oh, man. I mean, I, I feel like as a Christian, I'm like, I should go to when Jesus was alive. You know, <laughs> What are you even <laughs> hesitating for? <laughs> but other love, than that. Other than my, that. <laughs> my, my, my history, I love World War II. But I'm like, I don't know if I want to live, like, it's great to learn about, but I don't know if I want to be alive during those times 
to be honest, if I could go back, I would go back to high school when I was in high school. I yeah. love, I love like my high school year. I was in high school from 04 to 08. And so I don't know. Life was I just love good. That. So yeah. to give you, I think you're uh, talking with Coach Drew was my very first episode because I played there and he was kind to come on and talk with me. And, and so he also said he liked World War II battles and stuff, but then he hesitated. He goes, but, but I don't want to be in, in the war. Exactly. <laughs> like, so the, <laughs> I'm thinking this question, it's you get to go observe it, but you yeah. actually don't have to be in it. That's that's the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I would. I think I. I well, the World War Two. The, the uh, that was, that was an interesting time in history. Ooh, I'm, this this question I've never asked anybody else because I've never talked to somebody in your position. Favorite NBA? Ooh, I don't know. Well, I don't want to put you in a bet. I'll ask it, and if you don't want to, if you don't want okay. to answer, fine. Go ahead. Favorite NBA player to watch? To watch. Um. I'm really starting to enjoy uh, enjoying watching um, uh, Embiid. He is. I said this. I, I said I think he is. I can't believe I'm saying this publicly. I've said this privately, and it like debates with like other players. But I think he is the most skilled player in the NBA. Wow. Currently, yeah. because he can do name something that a great player can do that he can't and he's seven feet 200 whatever pounds he is like he can do it all like he can post he, he's not like the best passer ever but he can pass if he needs to oh he yeah. can score off the dribble he can go behind the back step back he draws fouls he can shoot threes like he you know one of my buddies like he doesn't shoot threes off the dribble like uh like Kyrie Irving not the same level but he can do it I think he just you hit know? a corner three off the dribble last night and it yeah. was incredibly hard <laughs> yeah he like so I, i'm enjoying watching him but you know like kind of like everybody else like you, you enjoy like trey young is fun to watch i mean he's he's hard to stop kevin durant steph curry yeah. like all the great players i mean in the nba you i sit there and i watch the game 82 times and they're I'm just amazed mm. by what happens on a night tonight kyrie irving we played in the last game of the year a couple of days ago and he did something in transition where he did like an in and out low dribble. He was looking one way, he went the other way, and then like did some stuff. Like a lot of times you can't even like redo it. But I I literally was like, wow. But you can't you can't amazing. show that, right? You can't show that. You can't show that. Yeah, you're sitting there like, <laughs> come on, guys. Hey, we, yeah, we gotta yeah. be better. You know? Uh, yeah. And you're, and you're like, I love the wow. fact that you that that I mean, I'll cut all of that out if you want me to. I hope I, no. okay. But no, I love no. the fact that you're amazed. Because I, I feel, I mean, I'm not that, I'm not near that level, but, all right, and I couldn't do any of the things that they're doing, but knowing skill, being around players for a while, I, I still watch the game sometimes, and I'm just amazed at the precision and, and the creativity and the things that they see and do. So it's really cool hearing that from you. Yeah, it's fun. Two more. Uh, how many cups of coffee do you drink per day? Zero. Never I drink coffee. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then last one, uh, Godfather or Star Wars. You can also say neither. Neither. Okay. At what what movie genre do you like to go to if you if you're going to do it? Documentaries. Huh. Favorite? I'm a documentary guy. What are you into right now? Um, I just saved like um, I just saved like four documentaries on Hulu um, recently. And I'm trying to think of what which which ones they were. Um, What's the, I can't remember what they were. There's um, two on net on Hulu right now that they're shows, but they're kind of documentary shows. Like uh, Dropout is fa and is fascinating about we crashed uh, and we crashed. Yeah, yeah. so like, we're actually we're we had the last we crashed up on deck. But I I love I'm, I I love history, but yeah. I love real. I love like I I can watch a movie. And I like movies and like I get a lot of flack from friends because they do movie quotes. I don't do movie quotes. I don't know movies that well. <laughs> I love documentaries and then go in and just research everything yeah. about it. Uh, same thing. And, and we talked earlier when we were talking about character and people, charismatic leaders going to, those are two great uh, examples oh. of that. And then on the other side is on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I just watched yesterday uh, about SpaceX. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a, it's a, a, a two, two hour one about Elon Musk and how they've taken our space program over that the opposite though, his character pushing that forward a great yeah. scene about he brought they they had just had three failed mess uh uh 
uh, launches in a row. He brought his team in and they're sitting there thinking he's about to light us up. And he says, Hey guys, I love that. We're failing. Let's keep going. Hey yeah. man, <laughs> uh, just so you know, this was unbelievable. Like you don't know me that well at all. We met one time in Cancun yeah, in Mexico, when, which is when great. you were, when you were, when you were getting into the hall of fame, uh, it, you just gave me an hour and a half of your, of your day. And I'm just so humbled and thankful for that. And this was incredible, man. Of course. Now, I'm, I'm glad we could uh, finally connect and do it. And this this is great. Yeah, we'll have to do it again. Part, are you saying there's going to be a part two? There can be a part two. Maybe. <laughs> uh... Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.